The American Civil War comes to a close in April 1865, but how does that happen? This lesson will cover the final events that occurred during the last four months of the Civil War and how it finally ended after four bloody years. The two major guiding questions that will be answered in this video are what happened during the Civil War in 1865 and what major battles and events took place that influenced the outcome of the war. Check out the following telegram. Notice who it is to and who it is from. Recall from the last video how Sherman had ended his march to the sea. How do you think a telegram like this would make President Lincoln feel? Here is a real photograph of Lincoln about the time in late 1864. The public finds out in the North about what Sherman had done in the South. Journalists couch the victory in Savannah as a huge success and positive outcome for the Union. Notice the wording in the headlines and how this may have been used to inspire the North to continue supporting the war effort despite the toll it had taken over the past four years. Many of you may wonder how Lincoln responded to Sherman's telegram. This reply reveals how Lincoln took the news. You can pause the video to read the whole thing yourself if you would like. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that Lincoln was unsure about whether Sherman's march to the sea would be the best strategy and had entrusted this decision completely to Sherman. Lincoln also brings attention to the fact that the rest of the world is looking on and watching what the Union Army is doing and how strong it really is. Lincoln closes with, again, entrusting the military decisions over to Grant and Sherman and stepping aside recognizing that they are the experts in this area. He encourages Sherman to tell his army that their president is grateful for what they have done. The two generals battling it off still at Petersburg are General Grant, Union commander, and General Robert E. Lee, Confederate commander. They are entrenched around Petersburg, Virginia in a nine-month standoff that has taken a toll on the Army's stamina, health, and morale. Despite small battles here and there, the waiting game and the constant shelling with long-range mortars are affecting the psyche of the soldiers. Lack of food and adequate conditions and are affecting the Army camps and making them unbearable to live in. The Confederates have less men than the North, and this is even more evident as new recruits enter Washington, D.C. A whopping 280,000 soldiers make up the Union Army in 1865. March 4th, 1865 is Lincoln's second inauguration ceremony in Washington, D.C. He gives a speech that emphasizes the need to strive on to finish the work that the North is in with this war for the ultimate goal of lasting peace. Eerily, the man who will shoot Lincoln about a month later is standing just overhead while Lincoln gives his inaugural address from the steps of the Capitol building. You can see from these real-life photos how close John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's future killer, was in proximity to the president. Could he have planned to shoot Lincoln here first? Was this a failed attempt? Just questions to think about. All right, back at Petersburg. 21 days later, Lee gives up the fight at Petersburg. He begins the day with one last attack at Grant Center. But four hours later, the Union line remains unbroken. The Confederates at Petersburg are starving. Lee has run out of food, supplies, and ammunition. He is out of options. Oddly enough, we have it on record that his Confederate soldiers do not want to leave Petersburg and retreat. They are determined to fight to the death in a suicide-type mission rather than surrendering. Lee knows the loyal ideology of his men in the southern, to the Southern cause. He knows that they would rather give up their lives than give up the fight. He decides, rather than surrendering at Petersburg, to retreat westward, abandoning the city, but not officially surrendering to Grant's army yet. 
He has hope that the southern towns west of Petersburg will have food, supplies, and the necessities his army needs to keep going and refuel for another engagement. Once the Confederates leave, the Union Army moves into the city of Petersburg. If I click here, you'll see photo photographs were taken of the devastation that was left from the shelling and the terrible conditions of the trenches that were left behind by the southern troops. The Union realize how bad off the Confederates truly are, and Grant realizes that he has the advantage, so he makes plans to pursue the retreating Confederate army and follow them west. When Confederate President Jefferson Davis gets word that Lee is abandoning Petersburg, General Lee sends the message to the Confederates in Richmond to evacuate the city because he knows that without his southern army to defend the capital that the Union army will rush in and gain control within hours or days. The remaining Confederate Army and other Confederate supporters do not want the Union to enjoy the exploits, steal and loot the Confederate valuables, or use what is left in the city as their own. Confederates are concerned that the Union troops will mock and will use the capture of the Confederate capital as a humiliation to the South if it is left intact. They also do not want the remaining food, supplies, ammunition, and weapons left there to be used by the Union enemy army. So rumor has it that the Confederates set fire to their own city before they fled. Two distinct fires spread rapidly throughout the city and much of Richmond was burned to the ground. Photographs that show what the city looked like after the fire show that only buildings made of marble, stone, or brick are left standing and that their insides are completely demolished. Another rumor about the fire of Richmond is that Union soldiers, upon entering the city, set fire to it like Sherman had done to hundreds, if not thousands, of farms in Georgia during the March to the Sea. The rationale behind the Union setting fire to the city of Richmond is that by burning it, the Confederates would have nothing left of value to return to and the burned Confederate capital would make a statement in the South that their Confederacy would never rise again. As you can see from the photographs, Richmond is in ruins from the fire, most likely, but also the destruction of war, probably shelling. Richmond had also been a factory town for the Confederate Army with an ironworks where cannons had been manufactured for the military. You can see the leftover cannonballs and cannons unused and sitting there as part of uh, what had been left in Richmond. Oddly enough, one building that had not been burned to the ground was the Confederate White House, where Jefferson Davis and his family had lived during the war. President Lincoln and his family um, go to visit Richmond, the captured city, which is now under the control of the Union and the Union Army. He visits the Confederate White House and goes upstairs to Jefferson Davis's office. Lincoln actually sits down at Davis's desk, the same desk where Davis had made decisions and signed orders for the Confederate government and the Confederate army. I wonder what he must have been thinking and why he chose to pause at this spot of his tour of the city. So Robert E. Lee and his Confederate army are pretty much on the run. As you can see from this map, we have Petersburg on the right, and the red lines show rebel troops and their march as they retreat further into the western part of Virginia. Mr. Connect and I have actually driven the roads from Petersburg to Appomattox, and along the way there are countless historical markers marking the many spots where Union troops caught up with the Confederate soldiers running from Petersburg and engaged in small battles that we refer to as skirmishes. You can see a few here marked by the date of the skirmish as we had from April 2 to April 8. A week's time of running in which Lee grapples with the fact that the western towns and villages do not have enough food and supplies to provide for his starving and ravaged army. Lee recognizes that if he continues to run, that the Union will eventually slaughter every last remaining man he has. 
He wants to preserve their lives and be able to send his troops back to their homes and their families and their farms in the south, to their wives and their children who are waiting and hoping for their return. Lee loves his men, and even though they would fight to the death for him, he realizes that it is best if he surrenders to Grant and attempt to use the surrender terms to protect the last of his army and keep them alive to get them home. This is when General Lee decides it's time to surrender. He sends word to General Grant that he needs to set up an official meeting with him about this. Grant draws up the papers and uses a house at the town of Appomattox Courthouse that will serve as the setting for the surrender. Now, it's not Appomattox, Virginia. Appomattox Courthouse is the actual name of the town, which may confuse you. There is a courthouse there, but Grant uses the home of a local grocer named William or Wilmer McLean. Ironically, Wilmer McLean was actually from McLean, Virginia, and he and his family had fled from their home after the Battle of Manassas in 1861 as a cannonball had shattered a wall in their kitchen during the fighting. McLean had chosen the remote town of App Appomattox Courthouse to call home. He was hoping to escape the war by moving there. Yeah, right. He's quoted as saying that the Civil War began in my front yard and ended in my parlor. And in many ways, that is a true statement. So Lee rides up to the house where Grant and his officers are awaiting his arrival. And after a few minutes of friendly conversation between Lee and Grant, they had known each other before the war and actually had gone to school together, they worked out surrender terms that were remarkably lenient towards the Confederates. The rebels had had to turn over their rifles that they had been issued from the Confederate Army. But apart from that, Grant allows rebel officers to keep their sidearms and permits soldiers to keep horses and mules and return to their homes in the South as long as they will not rise up again against the United States. Parole documents were issued to each Confederate soldier who surrendered their military arms and were sent home to their states down in the South. And here is one of those um, parole documents. News gets back to Washington, D.C. that the war is over because of Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. Washingtonians break out in celebration for the victory and parades and parties celebrate the return of the Union Army as they come home as victors. But here's the sad part. Four days later, the nation experiences tragedy. The United States doesn't know this yet. They are starting to recover, starting to celebrate. The United States flag is raised above Union-occupied Fort Sumter again, where the war had started. And this signifies that the South is now under completely, complete Union control again. President Lincoln takes his wife to Ford's Theater to see a play and enjoy the evening in the presidential box. And at 1013, in the third act of the play, Lincoln is shot by John Wilkes Booth, an actor and a Southern sympathizer. He is shot in the head, and Booth jumps from the presidential box on the st onto the stage. He breaks his leg, but still manages to flee the scene on foot. President Lincoln is rushed across the street to a nearby house where doctors attend to him and eventually confirm him to be dead. Lincoln's death is tragic for the nation the entire nation, both North and South. Instead of the necessary healing that needs to take place between the North and the South, Reconstruction and the years after the war are an uphill battle because plans to bring the wayward states back into the Union don't necessarily follow the plans that Lincoln had in mind that may have brought about positive change for the country as a whole.